The end of the 19th century in America is often associated with the rise of profound social movements like the temperance movement, the women's suffrage movement, and more darkly, even the eugenics movement. Today's guest tells the story of the birth of the animal rights movement. He's Dr. Ernest Freeberg this week on Story in the Public Square. Hello and welcome to Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University. Alongside me is my friend and co-host, G. Wayne Miller of the Providence Journal. Each week, we talk about big issues with great guests, authors, journalists, scholars, and more to make sense of the big stories shaping public life in the United States today. To help us this week, we're joined by Dr. Ernest Freeberg, a historian at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, and the author of a fascinating new book, A Traitor to His Species, Henry Berg and the Birth of the Animal Rights Movement. Ernie, thank you so much for being with us. Well, it's my pleasure. Great to be here. So you began your career actually in radio. Uh, tell us about the, the, the trajectory from, from radio to the academy. Yeah, that was really uh, the, the most amazing liberal arts education you could imagine, because I was working for a, a public radio uh, evening news program, and I got to interview different people uh, every single night. You know, one night it would be the visiting poet, and the next night it would be the governor's budget uh, committee and so forth. Uh, so I got to really explore a, a wide range, got to feel comfortable asking questions and following up. And uh, so it was, it, was a, it was a great experience. Uh, Did that experience as a, as a journalist, do you think, help you as a historian? I think it taught me to uh, see a good story when I saw one, I, I, you know, and to find ways to take a, a, a very real, tangible uh, moment and, and illuminate what it was, what its wider implications were, were about. Uh, it, it got me to trust asking my own questions, I suppose, which I think is an important thing for for historians to learn to do to sort of follow their own curiosity wherever it might might lead them. Uh, the drawback of it was that I was writing about a different topic every single night, and uh, I did come to admire the scholars, the historians, the people who had devoted themselves, you know, more than 24 hours to a given topic. And uh, so that that's really what drew me to, to think about going to graduate school, as well as the fact that most of the people who come in to, you know, I was dealing with a lot of very complicated uh, polemical issues like uh, taxes and abortion and so forth. And everybody who came in to talk to me e evoked a different version uh, of the American past in order to justify what they were doing. And since I was an English major in college, uh, I really didn't have the tools to keep them honest, uh, you know, to think about what, what, the, what the past really does tell us. Uh, I sort of naively thought graduate school would clarify that for me when in fact it's actually made it a lot more complicated uh, in one of those issues, but but uh, that's really what led me to feel like you know I I needed to I needed to know the background uh, in order to really uh, even be a better journalist. I, that was my first thought: was go to graduate school and then come back to journalism. So your your teaching and research passions are the cultural and intellectual intellectual history of the U.S. in the nineteenth and early twentieth century. What drew you to those periods in time? As opposed to any other period in time that you could have chosen in, in yeah. the long history of our country. Right. Well, I think it, I think it was because I really feel like that, especially the late 19th century, is the point where the world as we know it begins to emerge. You know, and, I, and I know historians could find that in a lot of other places, as you're suggesting, Wayne. Uh, but it feels to me like when you look at the post-Civil War period with the, the industrialization, urbanization, with issues about uh, immigration and and the melting pot uh, controversies in America, uh, the, the attempt to grapple with the legacy of slavery in, in a post-slavery world, all those things really, uh, you know, if you want to go back and trace the, the, the controversies and issues that we're dealing with today, 
a pretty good place to start is in that late 19th century period. So do you find that your students today are, are attracted to it as well for the reasons that you mentioned or perhaps for other reasons? I think they're made interested in it. I think I think it helps. You know, obviously, so many students come come to a history class uh, thinking that it's about memorizing names and dates and short term memory and get them out on an exam as quickly as possible. I think it helps them uh, to link what's going on in the world today to things that are going on in the past. Uh, so certainly, I think I have an easier job than my my colleagues who are teaching medieval history or or ancient history uh, in making those sorts of connections. Well, I wonder, Ernie, can you talk to us a little bit about that era at the end of the 19th century? We think about the, the last quarter of the of that era as being uh, the era of the robber barons. It's the era of the, uh, uh, the, the, the women's rights movement, the suffrage movement. Uh, it's, the, it's the era of uh, even the eugenics movement more darkly. Um, why does the end of the 19th century produce such great social churn? in the United States? Yeah, that's a great question. I think it's a combination of factors. I think, I think the, the issues of immigration uh, and, and racial conflict are, are central in this period. This, the, the, the country is moving from a, a predominantly rural to a predominantly urban uh, environment, right? By the 1920s, that seems complete, but it, by the 1890s, uh, you know, Frederick Jackson Turner declares that the, the frontier is over and uh, people are, are dealing with urban problems in a new way. And the problems are immense. Uh, so I think that, uh, you know, you can either emphasize how, how terrible things were, and they certainly were by our standards uh, in the late 19th century. Uh, but you can also see that this is a period where people felt empowered to try to make some changes uh, so that the progressive movement emerges out of out of all these problems without without. Uh, uh, the many problems we would not have the, the impulse, both in terms of voluntary organizations, but also in terms of calling on a greater and greater role for our government uh, to deal with these problems. Uh, you know, we're still we're still struggling with those questions today. What about the role technology played in this period? This, of course, was the advent, the dawn of the automobile. This was when, when electricity began to be spread or, or, or brought to many areas. It was the, the telegraph and, and other technologies. That, that must have had uh, an impact on, on what we're talking about here in terms of, of the culture. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I wrote a book about the impact of electric light on American life. Uh, and I explore that. And I think that for me, this time period becomes the period where Americans start to think of themselves as a nation of inventors. Uh, this was, the, and that this was somehow a uniquely democratic uh, process, uh, both the inventiveness, an enormous number of average Americans uh, filed for a patent and, and, and got into the business of trying to make a better mousetrap and, and you know, try to get rich th through this. Uh, but also people on the other end experiencing this enormous uh, technological advance. Uh, there was a, you know, in spite of all these urban problems, I, I was trying to capture the the incredible excitement that people felt uh, about technology. Even something as, you know, we think of as, as sort of mundane as the light bulb uh, was greeted as this, you know, enormous leap forward, as it certainly was. So for our audience sake, uh, the name of that book is The Age of Edison, Electric Light and the Invention of Modern America. I've not read it, but I look forward to reading it. So Ernie, you, uh, your first book though was The Education of Laura Bridgman, first deaf, uh, the first deaf and blind person to learn language. Uh, Laura preceded Helen Keller by several years, is that right? Yes, by, by decades. She was actually the, you know, the first person to be taught and uh, when Helen Keller came along, people said, oh, here's a second Laura Bridgman. Uh, whereas now, when I explain this story, I have to say, yeah, just like Helen Keller, but but 40 years earlier. Uh, and in fact, Helen Keller was taught uh, through uh, Annie Sullivan, who was trained at the Perkins School for the Blind in, in uh, Boston, uh, where Laura Bridgman had her, her big breakthrough. So in, in 2008, you published, I guess this was your second book, Democracy's Prisoner, Eugene V. Debs, The Great War and the Right to Dissent. And of course, Debs was, was a renowned uh, socialist and trade unionist. The book, by the way, was a Los Angeles Times Book Prize finalist. Tell us about the book and about Eugene Debs. <laughs> 
Yeah, this was his fifth run for the president in 1920, uh, which he did uh, while in the jail cell and uh, got close to a million votes uh, in the 1920 election. And it really was that story. I've, I've taught, I think my, my journalism background uh, led me to be interested in free speech and free press issues. And so uh, for years, I've been teaching a course about the impact of war on uh, democracy. And I would tell the story about Eugene Debs and the you know, great pictures of Debs uh, campaigning in his prison denims behind bars uh, and, and that he would get a million votes. And the students were, you know, wanted to know more about this. And, and I realized myself that was that was a, a, a great story. And I think it really turned out to be something bigger than uh, the Debs. It was it was the first nationwide uh, free speech movement uh, in order to get Debs out of prison. He got into prison because of the anti-war uh, uh, policies, the Espionage Act in 1917. He was sentenced to a 10 year prison sentence, uh, but he got out after three years. And that's that's largely because of this, uh, what what was called the amnesty movement to try to get him and other other people out of prison. About 2000 people were, were arrested, 1200 were sent uh, to prison for speaking against the war in that period. But Debs was the most visible one. And so this social movement organized around getting Debs out of prison. Uh, and it really pushed the conversation in ways that have shaped our own ideas about uh, the right to free speech in wartime. Uh, this is the beginning of what we would think of. Uh, the historian Eric Foner calls this the birth of civil liberties. You know, we think that we had the First Amendment uh, from the founding, uh, but it didn't really mean much until uh, these controversies that emerged out of World War One, and Debs was sort of at the center of that process. So your latest book is attributed to his species, which we're going to get into uh, during the remainder of, of the program. It's set in post-Civil War America. Talk generally about the relationship of people to animals at that time. It, it, we still yeah. early in that period, we're still a largely agrarian society. And then, of course, we move into a more urban society. But talk about the relationship of of these two species. Right. I mean, that's well, a good way many to... species, our species. Many, are... many species. <laughs> yes. Right. Yeah. In many ways, I think, you know, we have come, uh, I sort of th thought about this in terms of the way we think about a city now uh, and that and that cities are are largely devoid of animals, except what one historian says, says that, you know, we only uh, tolerate uh, pets and pests in urban environments now. Uh, and this is this sort of culmination of this period, but in the 1860s, uh, when the SPCA movement starts, animals are very much a part of the city. There are huge packs of stray dogs. Livestock is is penned right in right in downtown areas and slaughtered in, in downtown areas. Horses, of course, are the central uh, source of motive power. Uh, we think of this as the era of the steam engine, but in fact, steam engines were were helpless to do much without the support of horses. Uh, uh, especially as local transportation and as support for for uh, uh, the trains. So there was an enormous uh, interaction between humans and animals that I think is part of that transition from a rural environment to an urban environment. You know, it wasn't unusual for pigs to be wallowing in the in the alleys and clearing out the garbage, uh, or for people to keep a cow in the back alley of a of a tenement. Uh, so. Uh, things that seem alien to us now were very much a part of urban life uh, in the 1860s and 70s. So who was Henry Berg and what led him to uh, to, to his role in the, in this narrative? Yeah, he was a fascinating character. He was the, the, the founder of the of the ASPCA, which was the first such branch uh, in New York City. And That's the American people... Society uh, for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. Right. That's right. And uh, he uh, came to this idea late in life. He was he was in 53 years old when uh, he suddenly decided that this was his life's work. Uh, he was wealthy uh, heir to a, a, an industrial fortune. His father was a shipbuilder in New York City. He took uh, his inheritance and mostly uh, wrote a lot of really bad corny plays and, and bad poetry <laughs> and, uh, you know, sort of frittered away his life. Uh, I can relate in, to that, by uh, the way. <laughs> <laughs> the bad poetry part. Yeah. So he he was just he wandering the capitals of Europe, living a very luxurious lifestyle. In the in the during the Civil War, Lincoln appointed him to be uh, part of the, the embassy in Russia and St. Petersburg. Uh, 
he was out on the streets one day and he saw a teamster whipping his horse and it was it was just too much. He suddenly snapped and he demanded that the teamster uh, stop because he was wearing the epaulets and gold lace of, a, of a, an embassy employee. Uh, this teamster dropped the dropped the whip and Berg said this was a transformative moment for him that he suddenly realized he could do something else with his life at, at this age. Uh, he went to England on his way home from from Russia and learned all he could about the Royal SPCA, which had been founded in the 1820s. Uh, by anti-slavery forces there. And he brought that idea to the United States uh, and adopted it uh, in 1866, passed the first anti-cruelty law uh, in the country, the first one with, with any sort of meaningful enforcement power, and uh, founded the, the first of what became you know, a nationwide movement, uh, these SPCA organizations, in, in order to stop human cruelty to animals. Talk about the treatment of horses in particular. You mentioned that that was really the the epiphany or the apocalyptic moment for Berg. Take us back to Manhattan, let's say in the 1880, 1890. How were horses were, were used and, and abused? Do I have that correct? Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, the, they they were providing the fundamental uh, energy power for the, to, to move the city, to build the city, you know, and this is a, a time of enormous growth and expansion of the city. And it was done on the backs of horses. Uh, the biggest problem that Berg pointed to, although there were many was, was the overloading, you know, this was the beginnings of mass transportation and it was done through horse drawn trolleys, uh, that replaced the, the stage coaches and, and hacks that, that, uh, were freewheeling, but rather these were, were larger, looked like modern the trolleys uh, on tracks, and they were pulled by horses, but there was no regulation about how many human beings could pile onto those onto those uh, vehicles. And so, a vehicle that might be able to hold thirty five would have seventy people with people riding on the roof, and the horses were just you know burned up at a very rapid rate, and as a result of this. And the owners of the horses were you know this was a huge, very powerful business. This was this was a you know. A lot of money to be made in this, and the ho horse owners became very good at figuring out the maximum amount of work they could get for the minimum amount of input of stabling and oats and and hay and so forth. So they would work these horses, uh, and they would burn out within a, within a year or two. Uh, and you know they weren't going out to pasture; uh, they were quickly rendered and and recycled. Uh, and new horses brought in, uh, so they, they were really treated as as organic machines rather than as living, intelligent beings. In addition to that, of course, everything else was dri driven by horses, and so there was a lot of whipping and and forcing of horses. There were very few traffic regulations, so there would be massive traffic jams, and teamsters would be pounding their horses with bricks, and uh, you know, won't even set a fire underneath a horse in order to get it to get up. These sorts of things. This was a commonplace sight. Uh, on the streets of New York. So when Berg decided that he wanted to fight cruelty, most uh, uh, Americans in New York who, who signed on, and they did very quickly, uh, thought this is what they were fighting, was to, to protect horses. Uh, it, Berg was, you know, became controversial because he pushed the argument much further beyond horses. Uh, but that was really the, the, the primary impetus for the movement. Ernie, is there a, uh, uh, I think about sort of the civil rights movement of various eras, there's a, there's a, in, in the American experience, there is a great role for religious organizations and faith organizations. I think about the role of, uh, of, of Christian theologians and ministers in the abolition movement in the first half of the 19th century. Was there a role that religion or religious leaders played in the movement led by Henry Berg? I would say it's a it's a it was a, a form of, of liberal Christianity. Berg himself was not a, a conventional believer. Uh, I, I think that people considered associated uh, Christianity with the spread of enlightenment, with the spread of generosity and kindness. Uh, so Berg often uh, appealed to the clergy and 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 made arguments that these were essentially God's creatures, uh, not put here to, for us to exploit, but rather. That we had an obligation to them. You know, this is an ancient debate about our relationship with with uh, the rest of creation, uh, and it was sort of swept up into into that same argument. So I think it was a general uh, religious 
but also social progressive impulse uh, that was driving this for many people. So Berg had a talent for, for lack of a better word, showmanship, and he also had a, uh, a a close relationship with the press. He would bring journalists along with him on on his various expeditions and and what and campaigns. Talk about that. I mean, in in retrospect, that seems very smart to befriend the press so that you can get even greater attention to to your cause. Yeah. You know, it reminds me of a question I was trying to struggle with the book and in, in the book, and that is, why did this emerge as an urban uh, movement? I mean, it was not a rural. People in in in, the, in rural areas did not form branches of the SPCA. It was an urban thing, and it really had to do with people being exposed in, in a visual way to cruelty. I mean, you had more and more people crowded into cities. Uh, Fewer and fewer of them actually owned the horses and and stray dogs and things that they were, were they were seeing, but they were watching this this cruelty. And I think for Berg, the real challenge was uh, to touch people's consciences through making it visible to them. You know, he, he felt it was frustratingly easy for people to to look away. Uh, you know, he implored people when they're when they're driving in their carriages up to Central Park to to go strolling. On a Sunday afternoon, they should turn and, and make sure they look at what's happening to the livestock that are being hauled off of the trains and, and kept in these pens uh, in, in central Manhattan. So I think the journalists were, were a powerful tool for him to try to tell his story. Uh, and a lot of them found him to be ridiculous. And and that was part of, you know, the trade off for him. He was a, he was a man who did. Uh, had a pretty high opinion of himself uh, and and. Uh, really did not take this sort of criticism well, but he recognized the fact that if people were, were lampooning him for being an, an animal lover, uh, they were at least giving some publicity to the cause. And so that was that was his trade off. He said he would he'd go home and he'd be weeping in his pillow from the, from people making fun of him, but he pressed on. Ernie, this is the era of robber barons and of P.T. Barnum. Uh, what kind of relationship did he have with with those folks? Well, Barnum was, you know, you know, the great impresario of, of animals. And uh, I, I think, you know, from Barnum's perspective, he was the animal lover because he was roaming the world and bringing wild animals uh, into into his American museum in New York, which unfortunately burned out, down periodically and destroyed every animal in his collection. And then you'd have to go and round them up again. Uh, but his argument was he was he was bringing uh, the, the natural world to people's attention, uh, you know, and, and it is really the case that 19th century Americans saw a range of, of animals that was inconceivable uh, up till this point, you know, that this was one of the byproducts of industrialization and mass transportation uh, and, and the commercial transatlantic trade. Barnum was able to, you know, pay enormous sums in order to bring animals from, from Africa and Asia into American ports. Uh, but Berg considered this to be uh, not worth the, the pain and suffering that was inflicted on these animals. And so they went back and forth quite a bit. And, uh, you know, Berg considered Barnum to be exploiting animals for entertainment and that this was inappropriate. Barnum said, I'm, I'm educating people. I'm giving them something they want. Their people are fascinated with animals. And he often, uh, Barnum often said, look, I'm on your side. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm the Berg of Bridgeport, Connecticut. And, uh, and, and so they sparred back and forth. Uh, but in the end, Barnum and, and Berg became sort of allies. Uh, uh, and when, when Berg died, Barnum uh, gave some money in his will in order to, to build a fountain to dedicate it to, to Berg. Huh. So Berg believed correctly that animals feel pain. Did he have any, uh, any perspective or sense of other emotions you know, did he believe that animals uh, could could love or could be anxious or fearful? Or things that I think we would recognize in our in our own pets today, certainly during the pandemic of, for, you know, for different reasons. Did, did he yeah. go that far philosophically? Uh, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I think uh, he was less focused on this. He was he was very much a, a person who hated human cruelty more than he loved animals. And that was one of his, you know, the sort of mysterious things about him was that he didn't, he wasn't not an animal lover. He just hated the unnecessary uh, suffering. But many people in the movement uh, following his ideas uh, 
promoted what they called humane education. And it's exactly what you're talking about. What they're trying to do is, especially for the young, is to instill in them uh, a sense that, that animals are like us. And so the, the you know, enormous literature that was sort of anthropomorphized animals as, as you know, loving their families and loyal to their masters and, you know, real fascination with the St. Bernard dogs in, in Switzerland who were coming to the rescue of skiers and all these sorts of stories. Uh, the most famous of these was the, the novel Black Beauty, which is still considered a classic and uh, was, was a, a British novel, but was brought to the United States uh, during this SPCA movement and became a bestseller at that point. And a similar idea, understand animals, not simply as, as property or as servants of our desires, but rather as, as full live uh, beings with souls. Ernie, I've got literally about uh, 25 seconds left here. What is the legacy of Henry Berg and the SPCA today? Well, I think that 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 idea that we have an obligation uh, to other species uh, is is something which really begins in this in this period in a profound way. And I think for Berg, it was not simply the impulse, but it was also figuring out ways to institutionalize that, to pass a law, to put agents in the field that enforce the law, to drag people into court. All of this was a necessary part. It was not simply a matter of encouraging people emotionally. But it was also a matter of building the institution that we still have today and, and many, many more uh, that are actually out doing the work uh, of protecting animals. Well, it is a really fascinating and interesting read. The book is A Traitor to His Species. He's Ernie Freeberg. <laughs> Ernie, thank you so much for being with us. Oh, that's it's my all, pleasure. That's all the time we have this week. But if you want to know more about Story in the Public Square, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter or visit PellCenter.org, where you can always catch up on previous episodes. For G. Wayne Miller, I'm Jim Lutis asking you to join us again next time for more Story in the Public Square.